Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnabadi, for that kind introduction. Introduction. So the topic that I chose to speak about today is about back pain because I believe, as physicians, as clinicians, one day we all are supposed to know how to evaluate the patient with back pain, and not to say that all of you may at one point or the other experience back pain. It's such a common problem. So, but I will be talking today. The lineup is going to be on the extent of the problem, why we should know about back pain. Not a lot on that, and then about how to assess through a good history and examination, whether there are red flags or no red flags. A very controversial topic, as like what are these red flags in back pain, and then uh, a very important thing on imaging in the ideal setting versus the resource poor setting, because we cannot be doing ideal on the book things in settings like ours. So to say a few, just a few words on how common the global burden. Now we know that the, the current world population is estimated to be around 6.6 .6 billion people, and out of them, at any given time, 540 million people are estimated to be suffering from back pain of any type. And 80% of employed Americans apparently suffer from back pain at some point during their life. And even in our setting, we see that this is one of the commonest reasons for time away from work, suffering from back pain. So our clinic status, I just did a very brief audit on like this Monday clinic the, where I see the new patients. So out of 25 new patients that I saw, five patients that day also presented with back pain. So which is 20% of the clinic population of new patients. So it is undoubtedly one of the commonest occupational injuries and among the top few causes of time away from work. So I'll be taking you through four case studies, a 73-year-old female with back pain, a 60-year-old male, and a 42-year-old male, and a 56-year-old, uh, this son also again a male, with extensively investigated low back pains. So how to approach the patient? Few tips. Be patient. Back pain taxes you to no end. Sometimes, like there are many instances where patients come and start telling you about the back pain, which starts at the buttock and goes all the way up the spine to the head, and you're like, okay, stop, answer my questions. Like it's taxing. So be patient. That is number one. And listen well. First, you need to like, like in any other history, start with open-ended questions. Just let the patient talk for about 30 seconds before you intervene. Because that way, there are maybe like certain things that come out voluntarily, which you might not be able to get by digging leading questions. So let the patient speak first. But definitely, yes, at one point, you need to stop and ask the leading questions. One leading question like that that I find particularly important is like, when did you first experience, like, experience the back pain? Can you remember any trigger? And then the, that will get the patient also thinking and they will say, okay, I bent down to lift a flower pot or something and then I tried to straighten up, I couldn't. And that gives you the diagnosis, like what, what is the most likely diagnosis, likely a disc problem due to a slip disc or something. So likewise, get, with the, get started with the open-ended question and then direct the patient towards the closed-ended questions with the leading appropriate questions. And observe. It's very important to observe the patient. So I tell this to students all the time. When the patient walks in the clinic, just observe how they hold themselves up. How do they get up from where they were seated to get into the clinic? Because all this give you clues. And this is extremely important in cases of back pain. I'll tell you with a case study uh, later on. And very importantly, never be too busy to get up from your seat. Take the patient to the bed and examine the patient on the bed. I know that in very busy clinics, this is something that you tend to not to do because it's it's tiring. It is honestly tiring. And I like showed you the clinic number that I saw this Monday. So 25 patients, this is just a three and a half hour clinic. So it's extremely difficult. Like, not like a, just a medical clinic in rheumatology clinics. The histories are long. The examination is long. So in such a patient, when you see 25 patients, then the 23rd patient comes with a back pain, you're like, okay, that's the end of it. I'm not going to sit up, like stand up and examine. But you can't do that because for the patient, that is the only time they have with you. And like for them, that is the most important problem in the world. That's why they are there in the clinic with you. So don't feel that you are too tired to get up and examine because just by examination, you are going to get a lot of clues. So you are not supposed to be able to read any of this. The point I am trying to make is the causes of back pain is a long, exhaustive list. It's a very long list. If you can read anything of this, you deserve a medal for your vision because you can't. So what I'm trying to say is, what do we do? When it com comes to a patient with back pain, think anatomy and think pathology. 
because pain in any soft tissue region is caused by whatever the structures that are close by or any structure that is causing the referred pain. So think anatomically and try to figure out what are the potential causes because one common mistake that we do is that picture. When a patient comes with back pain, automatically we think about the spine. It's coming from the spine. But you'll be surprised more often than not, it has nothing to do with the spine. It's, it just needs a, like a bit of thinking, a bit of examination and a history and you will realize that more often than not, it's not coming from the spine. So just because the spine is one of the most important structures in the back, don't assume that all the pains that occur in the back are coming from the spine. Okay. So think about the other anatomical structures. It may just be coming from the skin. The patient may be having herpes zoster or something. So the pain may be coming from the skin. So unless you examine, you will not notice that. Okay. So similarly, like there may be muscles that are in and around the back that are causing the pain. Or more importantly, it may be an internal abdominal structure that is causing referred pain. One common such structure is the pancreas. You know that pancreas, pancreatitis, pancreatic cancers can cause back pain. The first presentation may be a back pain due to referred pain from there. Okay. And also the, the pathologically, like pathologically, what are the potential causes of back pain? There are four important areas that you cannot miss. Infection, inflammation, trauma, and malignancy. These are the four common causes, like pathological causes of what are going to cause back pain. So the history examination and the later the investigations are going to drive you through these. So with this, have a broad sort of classification of back pains in your minds before you start seeing the patient. And with that, you are going to narrow the differentials. Just observe the patient. Now, for example, this patient, a 16-year-old boy coming with a back pain versus a 38-year-old male coming with a back pain versus a 70 year old male coming with a back pain is your differential the same now thinking about the anatomy and the pathology that i told you about you will realize that the order of priorities changes based on the patient so what i'm trying to say is that exhaustive list of causes of back pain do not apply to each and every patient in the same way so just having a look at the patient make sure that you change your priority order of the differential diagnosis appropriately and then you assess the patient appropriately. So, for your top tips. As I told you, as the patient enters the clinic, observe the way that they move. And another thing, always remember, for the patient, the back is all this. For them, the back starts from somewhere near the scapula and ends near the buttocks. So, when they say back pain, the pain may be from any of this vast area. So, it's a huge area on the back. So, it is easy if at the beginning you ask the patient can you point to the site of the pain because that narrows down your differential considerably okay for example you would not be thinking of a vertebral wedge fracture if the patient is pointing to the buttock as the site of the pain something as simple as that okay so when in the beginning get the patient to roughly point to the area okay it's roughly coming from there because that makes your life easier Okay, and if it is spinal or in the region of the SI joint, so like if the back pain is like in the middle of the back or the region of the SI joints, think, can this be inflammatory? Is this inflammatory or mechanical? Again, differentiate it in the beginning. So for the students, I have taught you how to differentiate between inflammatory and mechanical pains during the rheumatology lectures. Like I have told you, mechanical pains relieve with rest. Think about the last time that you suffered a knee injury trying to run somewhere. What you do instinctively is to rest because with rest your pain will settle down. But inflammatory pains do not settle with rest. They actually worsen after a period of rest. The, the joint is going to feel stiffer and the pain is going to be more after a period of rest. That is because of the inflammation that goes on without interruption and the lymphatics that are not draining the cortisol. So many theories why this inactivity rest happens. Inactivity stiffness happens, but inactivity basically worsens the pain. So for back pain also, that is the same. So for any patient with back pain, I would say they will say the first thing in the morning when they get up, the pain is unbearable. So they, they, they feel stiff. But if it is mechanical, within minutes, within like two, three minutes, they are okay. Like the first one, two minutes are difficult. Like they'll be stiff after waking up, but like they stretch a little bit hands and then maybe bend this way and that two minutes and they are fine but if this is inflammatory it is going to be more prolonged than that 
in the back it may not reach the typical 30 minute cutoff that you talk about when you talk about the hand joint stiffness but it may be 15 minutes 30 minutes 20 minutes maybe but still it is considered a prolonged morning stiffness okay then about the red flags so before we go through the list just one thing about, about this red flags now it's very controversial if you go through the medical evidence, they say like there are certain studies which have looked at 8,000, 10,000 patients and seen whether the red flags truly reflect what is happening. And like most of the studies have found, no, not really. But there what I would say is, okay, you need to add to this list a bit of common sense as well. Because here now if you look at uh, like uh, the fifth one from down, from fifth one from the bottom, you will see that patients over the age of 50 years is also a red flag. Okay, does that mean every patient over the age of 50 years who has a back pain has something sinister going on? Not really. So, you have to add a bit of common sense into this mix as well. Okay, so red flags in the sense, what you need to be aware of. One thing that I would say is the pain that is increased or unrelieved by rest. Now, that is what I told you, which is an inflammatory back pain. In addition to that, is the patient having constitutional symptoms? Maybe fever, loss of appetite, loss of weight, like such constitutional symptoms. If they are there, like back pain, may be something to think about. There may be sinister causes such as infection or malignancy. And then another thing, whether there is a history of trauma, which may not be direct. It's not that somebody came from the back and like hit them from behind. But sometimes indirect trauma, like they bend down to pick something up as I told you earlier and then try to straighten and then that was the trigger of the pain. So such a mechanical trigger, which was a direct or indirect trauma. Okay. And then any neurological symptoms such as sphincter incontinence or lower limb neurological weakness or numbness, paresthesia. Be careful. You need to examine more carefully. You may need to investigate more carefully. Okay. And also this uh, history of tuberculosis or cancer and the history of cancer may be 20, 30 years ago. Still, if there is a history of cancer, be vigilant. Okay. And also the possibility of immunosuppression. Other than this, the typical immunosuppressive things such as medication and HIV and the IV drug users, which we don't really see that commonly in Sri Lanka. One thing that we do see commonly and ignore also very commonly is diabetes. Particularly uncontrolled diabetes, poorly controlled diabetes over the long term may give rise to very sinister causes of back pain without any fever such as infective discitis or infective spondylitis and the patient may not have fever. Because again, we know why fever occurs. Fever happens because of your immune response against an infection. So if your immune system is not working, there's nothing to cause the fever. So the patient may be having a serious infection without having any fever at all. So do not expect all the typical features of an infection, particularly when it is bone and spinal infection. Okay. So I'll give, get you through the first case. So this was a 73-year-old female who presented with lower thoracic pain. So actually she had been investigated before she presented to me for a long time for upper abdominal pain. That, that was a complaint like upper abdominal near the cipis sternum and the lower chest that region pain. So she had scans, she had liver functions, she had this investigation, that investigation, everything was negative. She even had an endoscopy which failed to like detect any cause. But when she presented to me through the history, I realized the pain actually started at the low back, uh, upper back. It was actually at the lower thoracic region of the upper back and it was radiating girdle pattern into the front. So the front pain was what she was worried about, but actually the pain was starting on the back. Okay. So I thought, okay, could be started from the spine and I asked her to do a lower thoracic x-ray and at the same time in the history, she had a history of breast cancer 15 years ago. So she was in on annual follow up at the Cancer Institute Maharagam and they said like no recurrence. There was nothing to be concerned about. And through these exhaustive investigations that she presented to me before she came also like everything was normal basically. But one thing that was being a red flag to me was that she was treated with letrozole. So letrozole is something that you use as adjuvant therapy in can like breast cancer chemotherapy particularly. It's an aromatic basal. And it is very well known to be associated with a high risk of osteoporosis. They develop severe osteoporosis by on letrozole. So that's why I was worried maybe this is a wedge fracture. And I did an x-ray. Yes, to the truth. Now she had a D12 wedge fracture, D11. And I did get a, a DEXA scan. The lowest T-score was minus 3.9 in the lumbar spine. So I started on pamidronine because IV bisphosphonates are very helpful in managing pain coming from acute fractures of the spine. 
So she actually had a remarkable response. The pain disappeared. But three months later, she is now started getting again non-specifically unwell. She came for the second dose of Tamidronate and I, like, I was seeing her. She didn't look quite right. Even though the pain from the back had gone, something was not right. So I told her to see the see an oncologist. So she said the next appointment was in three more months at Maharagam. I said, no, you can't wait until then. Go and see another oncologist. And she saw him and asked to do a technetium 99 bone scan. And she had was widespread secondary bone deposits, presumably from the previous breast cancer, which was 15 years ago and was apparently cured. So this is the problem. So looking back, most likely that D12 wedge fracture, D11 wedge fracture was not just due to osteoporosis. It might have been a combination. You never know. Because in the technetium scan, it had taken up the, the tracer, but it can just be just happen when there is a fracture as well. So could be due to either, but this is why I say red flags, past history of cancer is a red flag and she's 73, although none of the other investigations are abnormal. Like remember, even her hemoglobin was normal, even with widespread cancer, the inflammatory markers are normal, even hemoglobin was normal. So can happen. And the second case was a 60 year old male with 10 years of low back pain. So prolonged history of low back pain presented with significant progressive worsening over two years with associated loss of appetite and recently increased thirst. So apparently the, the, the history of low back pain was very long, so 10 years of low back pain. But what was interesting was that over two years, the character of the pain changed. He actually told me that nocturnal pain was there, like he could not sleep because of the pain and even if he slept early hours of the morning, he would wake up from sleep because he trying to turn from side to side was excruciatingly painful. And in addition, this loss of appetite and the increased thirst was there for about nearly six months. So something was changing. And this is the truth. He had been on everyday NSAIDs for the past two years, daily NSAIDs. And before that, like at the beginning of like uh, about one year prior to the, this presentation, he had an x-ray of the, thorax, uh, the lumbar spine which showed extensive degenerative changes. So he was labeled as having lumbar spondylosis. So this was the diagnosis that he came with. However, severe pain, disturbing sleep and not responding to even potent NSAIDs such as acyclopine and sodium, which is a very potent uh, like NSAIDs, he was not responding to even that. And the serum creatinine was 8.2 milligrams per deciliter. So at this juncture, is there any other investigation that you would like to do in this particular patient? Yes, a full blood count. And these are the findings. So in the full blood count, white cell count was 3.5, platelets were 445, and HB was 6.5. ESR was 125 millimeters in the first hour. And the serum calcium was 3.4. So for students, the upper limit of the ionized serum calcium is roughly about 2.2 for most of the labs. So anything above 3, you automatically think cancer because that high hypercalcemia is very uncommon with the other courses. So above 3, think is this malignant hypercalcemia. And this was his skull x-ray, which was a paper pot skull. So very classic history of multiple myeloma. So what you need to realize then in that history, where things went wrong was, yes, he had a history of back pain for 10 years, which is very unlikely to be due to multiple myeloma. However, the character of the pain changed. You might have heard horror stories about patients coming with years and years of headache and nobody cared and then the patient has a CT and ultimately found to have a brain tumor. So is the years and years of headache due to the brain tumor? Most of the time, no, it's not. It's just there in the background because headache is so common. It's just there in the background. But if you really dig into the history, you will see that at one point, the character of the pain changed. And that is what we missed. And that is where the, the litigation comes from because the character of the pain changed and the patient was complaining, but nobody bothered because this is such a prolonged history. Right, so we'll move on to the essential examination. So that is that was all about the history, the red flags and like what you need to ask about. So inspect for obvious abnormalities. So in this one, to me, looking at this, there are very obvious abnormalities, but for the untrained eye, like you might think, okay, what is abnormal? So in this one, there are three things or rather four things that you need to look at. If you look at this child from the back, you will see, if you look carefully enough, that the levels of the two shoulders are not equal. On the left side of the child, the shoulder has stooped lower compared to the right. 
that is one and then if you look at the hips again look at the left hip of the child so on this side there is a bump so there is like on one side the hip appears higher than on the other side that is number two number three look at the scapulae one scapula appears very prominent that is on the child's right side the scapula appears prominent whereas on the left the scapula appears to have bony and now look if you look in the midline you will see that the line that is supposed to indicate your spine in the midline is not really straight it's only slightly curved if you look at the x-ray this is what you are going to see so this is a case of thoracic scoliosis again unless you examine you are going to miss this so do not wait for the x-ray to diagnose scoliosis because that's an examination finding right and this one if you go to the ward tomorrow you will see like the students if you go to go to ward 8 tomorrow you will see a patient just like this so looking at the face you might be able to see that he's actually trying to look up but he can't his eyes are like directed upwards but this is as far as his neck would allow him to see so the the cervical spine movement is very much limited the usual c curve of the cervical spine is lost and is actually now anteriorly curved and the thoracic kyphosis is the most obvious abnormality but in addition to that the hips are also abnormal the hips are actually in flexion okay so this is what we call the typical question mark posture of axial spondyloarthritis or otherwise what you know as ankylosis spondylitis and if you do the x-ray this is what you will see bilateral sacroiditis and there is significant calcification of the paraspinal ligaments causing the bamboo spine appearance and if you look at the hips, there is very severe advanced secondary osteoarthritis of the hips. How we know secondary is because the whole uh, joint space, like equally, all parts of the joint space is lost. Because if it is primary osteoarthritis, it's usually only the top part that gets lost by the rest of the joint space is preserved. But here equally, symmetrically, the whole joint space is gone. So we call this secondary osteoarthritis of the hip. So... Coming to the next point, so this was all about examining for the abnormalities on inspection and then examine the back and try to localize the tender point. Yeah, not so uncommon. I have seen patients coming with back pain and wearing a lumbar corset and when you try to examine and like try to localize the pain, this is where the pain is and you have to tell the patient, you better go give the lumbar corset back to the pharmacy and refund yourself because it's about 6,000 rupees because it's not going to do any good. What is a lumbar corset going to do if your pain is at the coccyx? It's not going to do anything okay so this is why it's important that you examine the patient so palpate along the spine from top to bottom and as you go on the patient will suddenly jump up from the couch as you palpate across the coccyx because it's a very painful condition and the management is very straightforward you don't need any investigation not even an x-ray for you to diagnose that this is coccygodynia it's, it's a completely clinical diagnosis and the management is very straightforward and this is another one, deep luteal syndrome, otherwise very commonly known as piriformis syndrome, and one of the commonest reasons, missed reasons of back pain. Because again, there's no investigation, it comes from examination. So if you, the students cannot remember where the piriformis muscle is, because you usually can't remember your anatomy, it's a very deep muscle in your gluteal region, starting the origin is from near the sacrum on the side, and it goes and attaches to the greater trochanter laterally. And it's extremely deep. It is inside the pelvis. So why it causes pain on the side of the buttock? So how patients usually come is they come, come with buttock region pain, which they say they call it either back pain or hip pain. That's what they tell you. And when you try to like, if you ask them what exacerbates the pain, they'll say if they're seated for too long, the pain is going to get more. And if they're seated for too long, tries to stand up, they can't stand up like quickly because of the pain. And... The tender area, like if you if you flip the patient over on the bed, put them on the prone position, and if you examine, this is the region where you are going to get the pain, or the tenderness. This is where you will get the tenderness. And the common differential is obviously sacroiliitis, okay, because this is where you get the SI joint, so sacroiliitis is a differential. And the other is is this sciatica, because actually speaking, some patients with this condition come with sciatica-like pain. The reason is in about 30% of the population, your sciatic nerve pierces the travels as the piriformis muscle in its course. It's an anatomical variation. It comes through the piriformis muscle. So if the muscle is in spasm, your nerve gets irritated. So you can come with sciatica as well. So 
perform the relevant maneuvers and you will know for sure one is called this fair test so it's very easy okay very easy you can do as an outpatient so get the patient to lie down on the normal side not on the abnormal side lie down the normal side and then get the hip flexed to 90 degrees and adduct adduct the affected hip so it goes down and then hold at the patient's ankle and try to internally rotate at the hip okay so that's what fair stands for flexion adduction and internal rotation that's the meaning of fair and if that in like elicits pain at the buttock this is a positive test for deep luteal pain syndrome it's very easy to do and a common condition this is the other very simple test it's called bt test again the same same position like the patient lies down with the affected side up and get the patient to flex at the hip and the knee and then lift the affected side leg off the side off to the side and if this causes pain again in the gluteal region that is a positive test both these conditions both this test indicate the gluteal pain syndrome why i say it's very important is again no investigation is needed you do not need advanced imaging and even if you do a spinal mri you cannot come to a diagnosis there okay so do not waste an mri just because the patient has a sciatica and the treatment is again with physiotherapy. A good physiotherapist is able to cure this condition. So years of back pain just cured over two weeks if you go to a good physiotherapist. Right? And another commonest performed but commonest misinterpreted tests in the clinic setting for back pain is SLRT, straight leg raise test. Because not many people know how to perform this test. That is the problem. So get the patient to lie down. And then the examiner lifts the patient's relaxed leg off the couch. And a positive test is indicated by radiating pain, not by back pain. The patient says, ah, okay, where does it hurt? They show you the hip or the back. That's not a positive test. It has to be the sciatica-like pain. It has to be the back pain radiating along the leg at an angle of 30 to 60 degrees. If it is above 60 degrees, I tell you, if you are not a sports person, try lifting your leg straight leg above 60 degrees. It is painful for anybody. Okay, so that's not a positive test. And the first 30 degrees, if they have pain, that's malingering. Okay, you are not supposed to have any pain in the first 30 degrees. Okay, so those are not positive tests. So positive test is indicated only by sciatica, like radiative pain that is elicited at 30 to 60 degrees only. And this one is another common test that you can do in the clinic. If you're suspecting scoliosis, get the patient to bend forward without bending at the knees. And you will see in this one that there is a slight bump on this side, on the back. This is a very sure sign that the patient has thoracic scoliosis with a rotational deformity. It's asymmetrical. One side will show a hump when the patient bends forward. So you see these do not take a lot of time. We'll take two, three minutes out of your time. So please do them. And the most hated one I know is the neurological examination. Okay, who has time for this? I usually don't. But then that's why you have what is called an abbreviated neurological examination of the lower limbs. If you do just these four maneuvers, you will be able to diagnose about 80% of the relevant neurological deficits in the lower limbs. Just four. So, ankle and big toe dorsiflexion. Just get the patient to dorsiflex the ankle, dorsiflex the big toe. Okay. You should remember like what is the anatomy of this. It's L5S1 if, if there is a weakness in this. And then ankle and the knee reflexes. Light touch perception on the medial and lateral sides of the foot and the calf. You just touch and see is there anything wrong. Is there absent sensation. This is it. You only need these three along with the straight leg raise test to diagnose most, most of the, not all definitely, but the majority of the important physical signs that are associated with a neurological deficit in a patient with back pain. So pretty straightforward. Okay. So, so that's all about history and examination in a patient coming with back pain. Essential investigation. So this is one place where I feel very passionate about because of the number of unnecessary imaging that you'll do. So any patient coming with back pain ends up with an x-ray. Any patient coming with knee pain ends up with an x-ray. Please don't. We'll see why. So in majority of patients, I would say in more than 50% of patients coming with back pains, you do not need to investigate further because there are usually simple mechanical causes if you examine enough. Above 50 years, 
it is maybe prudent to do a minimum of a full blood count ESR and a UFR, maybe, but again, not in all the patients. But if there is anything that flags up to you in the history and the assessment, and particularly if the back pain doesn't settle in six weeks, maybe better to do. Okay, go ahead and do. Imaging. You need to know when to image, which weaves to ask for. You do not go for uh, lumbar spine AP lateral for every patient. No, there are other weaves that we, you may need to do. Particularly, like say, if you are wanting to see the, whether the patient has axial spondyloarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, you ask for the SI joint cone weave. You have to ask for that way because the radiographer doesn't know what you are looking for. Okay, so if it is called SI joint, bilateral SI joint cone weave. So ask for the cone weave. And which weaves, that's what I said. And what investigation? What is the imaging modality that you are going to go for? Okay. So, again, we'll go through this with a clinical case. A 42-year-old, now he was a rural farmer from Monaragala with a mechanical back pain. And he localizes this to the lower thoracic and the lower lumbar region. So, two regions in the spine, he localizes this. And by the time he came to me, he had been on, uh, like, on treatment on and off, mostly self-treated for nearly three years. So, you know, self-treatment is very easy in Sri Lanka. No, you go to any pharmacy, ask for a painkiller, they give you a painkiller. So, he had been on painkillers for nearly three years by the time that I saw him. So, 42 years old and a rural farmer, okay, most of them have mechanical back pains. Okay, so it's something that is not very significant. However, what raised the flag was that he had significant point tenderness over the lower thoracic vertebrae in the midline. So, I decided, okay, maybe he is for an x-ray because of this significant point tenderness. And also, there was a mild hypotic deformity in the lower thoracic region and the significant pain level. So, it, it was the, the visual analog scale was nearly 7 and sometimes 8 out of 10 on the days that he had bad pain. So, I thought, okay, maybe prudent to go for an x-ray. And this is what I saw. In the first image, if you see, there is a very mild kyphotic deformity, chi, sorry, uh, kyphotic as well as a scoliotic deformity okay but you look very close in here he actually has a wedge fracture at two levels d11 and d12 both he has anterior wedge fractures so this is why it is important to pay attention to the subtle clues in the history and the examination as i told you his pain was out of proportion and three years of ongoing pain very unlikely to be just a simple mechanical cause okay so, 42 years old, male, they are not supposed to have edge fractures. So, you need to investigate them further. So, he is actually under investigation at the moment as to why he suffered this because he denies any history of known trauma. Because a thoracic wedge fracture takes a considerable amount of trauma in a normal spine, in a normal density board. And the last case, this was a 53 year old male who presented with low back pain. The first presentation was elsewhere. And he had uh, an x-ray lumbar spine done, which had, was not formally reported, but in the clinic book, it had been recorded as normal. And the MRI lumbar spine, he had one. So, it was reported as having minor degenerative changes only. He was given painkillers and was discharged from the clinic. And he came to me for a second opinion. Four years, three clinics and two Ayurvedic physicians later, when things are not settling, he came to see me and asked, why am I having this much of that pain? And when he walked in, he had a stoop posture and he was wearing a big hat on a scorching hot day. I had to ask him, can you please remove the hat just to see what, happened, what was happening? And when he was asked to remove, he had extensive scalp psoriasis. So because of stigma only, he was wearing the hat because he didn't want to go out with that scalp psoriasis. Not just the scalp. And if anybody bothered to examine his back, take off his shirt, back top to bottom, there was plaque psoriasis. Okay. And the neck movement was absent in all directions. And on hindsight, I got him for the second visit to bring all the x-rays that he had home, which are reported, no, recorded as normal, not reported, recorded as normal. And on the lumbar spine x-rays, he had bilateral grade 4 sacroiditis. Why was this missed? Because nobody was looking at this side. He was complaining of back pain and everybody was bothered only about the, thorax, the lumbar spine. So the lumbar spine only had very minor degenerative changes on the x-ray. But SI joints are bilaterally fused. So, grade 4 is fused, completely fused. It's not there anymore. Okay. So, on hindsight now, why was his MRI reported as normal? The reason being, now this is why I told you, you have to ask for the correct investigation. 
I'm not a radiologist and I'm very bad with radiographs, but even I can see is yes, true that in the MRI, it was only number spine degenerative changes. Because if you are asking for a number spine, like for a spinal MRI in a patient suspected to have inflammatory arthritis of the spine, you need to ask the whole spine, not just the lumbar spine, particularly in patients who have psoriatic arthritis affecting the spine. Not like in the typical ankylosis spondylitis, in psoriatic disease, their cervical spine is affected disproportionate to the rest of the spine. So we have seen patients who have only the affection of the cervical spine, whereas the lower spine is completely normal. Okay, so that can happen. So you have to ask for the whole spine of the uh, MRI along with bilateral SI joints because the SI joints are out of the radiological field where they place the magnets in the MRI. So if you want to image the SI joints, you have to ask for it. Without that, they are not going to do. Okay. And also you have to ask for a sequence called fat suppression imaging because without fat suppression imaging, they will not be able to tell you whether this is just degenerative changes or what we call NPCL edema. NPCL edema is the feature that you see in those with ankylosing spondylitis. So this is why it was missed even though an MRI was done. So the bottom line was that MRI, even in the government sector, now when we ask for investigations in the government sector, we don't really think about what is the cost because it is supposedly free of charge. It's not really free. We are all paying for them out of our own pockets through the tax money. So if you think about a, like lumbar spine MRI in the private sector, it's about 25 to 30,000 rupees based on the extent that you are imaging. So this is a loss of 30,000 rupees without any gain because you asked for the wrong investigation. And why was the wrong investigation asked? Because nobody examined the patient properly to see what was the clinical diagnosis. So this is why before you go for imaging, before you go for investigation, you should first have a clinical diagnosis. This is not just for back pain. For students, I tell this all the time, whatever the thing that you investigate for, have a clinical diagnosis or a differential diagnosis first. You do the investigations guided by your clinical diagnosis to refute or to confirm that. Right? Okay, to summarize and the take home messages that I want you to take home a good history and a thorough examination should guide the investigation. And it said it cannot be replaced by investigation. So it's history examination. And the majority of the back pains are harmless and they do not require imaging. And if you do decide to image, choose the correct technique, whether it is X-ray, MRI, or CT, and the V. And discuss it. If you are not sure, tell them the history and discuss with the radiology team. They'll be happy to guide you rather than blindly investigating. And even in a busy clinic, take an extra minute to examine the patient properly because that is going to save years of doctor shopping by the patient and a lot of expense in the, sex, uh, in the health sector. Thank you.